for tuning into our webinar this evening. This presentation is part of the North Sound Stewards Citizen Science Program with resources and the Watka Marine Resources Committee. Um, originally, this was supposed to be in person, but due to the pandemic, we decided to hold it online um, just to be safe. So thank you for taking the time out of your day um, to tune in and a big thank you to Dr. Brooke Love for her patience and flexibility in holding this presentation online. Um, so before we get started, I do just want to jump into a little bit of housekeeping. I see that everybody is muted, which is great. Um, just make sure that you stay muted, um, just that any background noise won't carry over into the presentation. Um, and I see that everybody has their video feed off, which is great. Um, our next webinar is currently scheduled for April 20th at 3 p.m. And that's going to be given by Lisa Hillier from the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife on monitoring forage fish of the Salish Sea. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, we ask that you submit them into the chat box um, and Dr. Love will get to them um, just to minimize the interruptions. And lastly, make sure that you log these hours and you track it forward. These do count towards your hours. Um, so with that, let me go ahead and introduce Dr. Brooke Love. Okay, um, Dr. Brooke Love is a chemical oceanographer and academic program director of the newly forming Marine Program at Western University. This program, with a strong applied and interdisciplinary and place-based focus, is a collaboration of three departments of the Shan and the Shannon Point Marine Center. Her research focuses on how ocean acidification affects ocean food webs and how marine plants can alter local acidification conditions. She earned her doctorate at the University of Washington studying deep sea hot springs and building instrumentation. She has built multiple systems for experimentally controlling acidification conditions in the lab and thinks of plumbing as a second calling. She is interested in improved educational opportunities and is a collaborator on recently funded grants to connect educators to tools and techniques for using ocean data in the classroom. Um, the title of her presentation is Ocean Acidification in the Salish Sea. So with that, Dr. Love, you can take it away. All right, thanks, Destiny. Um, welcome, everybody. And um, thank you for filling out our poll. I can see that there's um, more people arriving and, and filling it out, which is great. Um, and we are just gonna go ahead and get started. And you could keep doing that for a couple more minutes and then we'll look at, look at the results of that. Um, in just a minute. So, like Destiny said, we're going to talk about ocean acidification um, in the Salish Sea today. And I like to always give my thank yous up front. So, um, I wanted to recognize the places where we've got some funding from for doing the work in my lab where we study ocean acidification, um, including the National Science Foundation and Huxley College and the Department of Natural Resources. Um, Shannon Point Marine Center and the Department of Fish and Wildlife also been really helpful. And then all these people that you can see over on the side here, researchers, graduate students, undergraduates, and so on and so forth. I'm not actually going to spend a ton of time talking about my own research. Um, it's really more of kind of a big picture, but I still like to, to thank all the people that have helped me learn what I know about it. I also like to give a shout out for Western. Um, Western is a really great place um, to be a scientist and to learn about science. Um, so, you know, we've got a lot of really good stuff going on, including our new marine science major. So if any of you are interested in studying marine science or know someone who is, encourage them um, to check it out. So, but we're here to talk about ocean acidification. And the three questions that I think are really fundamental here is, you know, what is ocean acidification? Why should I care? And what can I do about it? So, um, that's what we're gonna do. And the first thing we're gonna do uh, is take a look at the poll, which not everybody has finished it yet, but that's all right. We're gonna, I think we've got enough to get a picture of what's going on out there. So I'm gonna end that poll and share the results. And hopefully you all can see this. Um, so it looks like we've got a pretty good split. 
uh, pretty even between people who know a little bit, a medium amount, and you know, a fair amount about ocean acidification. So that's that's good. Um, we'll try to kind of hit various levels um, and have something for everybody. In terms of what people are interested in covering, we also have a pretty good spread across all of these different areas from the kind of basics, um, a little bit more about the positive effects on marine life. That's something you probably don't hear a whole lot about. Um, but people are pretty interested on this across, we, maybe we can go a little light on global fisheries. Okay, great. So that's what I needed to know. And um, now we can move on. All right, so what is ocean acidification? Well, I mean, I don't think most of you probably already know this, that it's carbon dioxide from fossil fuel burning that makes its way into the ocean. 20 trillion pounds a year of CO2 are added to the ocean from fossil fuel burning, which is just, I mean, it's just a two with a bunch of zeros after it, right? It's like a really big number. So what does that actually mean? Uh, that's the equivalent of about one bowling ball per person per day for every single person on earth. So you can imagine yourself going down to the beach in the morning and, you know, heaving in your bowling ball. And it's, so it's, it's about eight and a half pounds, maybe a little bit of a light bowling ball. But since we live, you know, in an industrialized country, um, even if you're really virtuous, your carbon footprint is probably more than that. So up to maybe a heftier bowling ball or maybe a couple of bowling balls. So the oceans are really big, but that's a lot, a lot of carbon. So where is all that coming from? Well, in Washington, our emissions are actually largely from transportation. So you can see here 62% of emissions in Washington state are transportation with sort of a smattering of different other sectors. It's a little different if you look at the global picture. Transportation is a much smaller piece of the pie and it's more evenly distributed between things like industry and electricity and heat production and agriculture and so on and so forth. So most of the things that we're doing kind of in modern day life are producing carbon in one way or another. It's just something to be aware of. All right, so here's the basic picture. We've got carbon being emitted, 142% increase in atmospheric CO2, which has led to a 1.4 um, degree increase in atmospheric temperature. This is what's already happened since the pre-industrial times. And that's resulted in a half a degree increase in sea surface temperature, but also not from the temperature, but directly from the CO2, which is being dissolved into the ocean, a 30% increase in ocean acidity. So the pH change from 8.2 to 8.1, which doesn't seem like a big change, but it's a log scale and it's actually a change of 30%. So ocean acidity is already increased by 30%. Um, and it's on track to go up quite a bit more. So just to review, 25% of the CO2 generated by humans has already been absorbed by the ocean, 30% increase in acidity, and it's gonna keep going. It's gonna go up another 100 or 150% by 2100. So twice as acidic. Um, and so it's a big change and it's happening fast. This is happening 10 times faster than in any period over the last 50 million years. So. CO2 and pH have changed before in the oceans, um, but not this fast. So it's a, it's a big change and it's happening pretty fast. So I'm not gonna go into details on the chemistry. Um, if anybody wants details, you can ask me about it at the end, but here are the basics. The CO2 in the water is gonna go up. It'll at least double. That's related through a series of equations to bicarbonate and carbonate. Bicarbonate you're familiar with is like baking soda. So that's gonna increase. And then carbonate, which is like Alka-Seltzer or this calcium carbonate, which is what shells are made out of, it's gonna decrease um, significantly. So what does that mean? Well, things that use CO2 and bicarbonate as a raw material like plants and algae, probably be happy with this on the sort of just really kind of basic level. Things that make shells, less happy. But a big question is what about everybody else? So that's some of what we're gonna talk about. 
All right, so here's the basic picture. You've got increasing atmospheric CO2, which leads to lower pH, um, which can lead to adverse biological impacts. So that's the kind of first part of the story that we'll talk about. Now, I think, you know, a lot of you indicated that you're interested in some of these, you know, more local species, talking about herring, crab, and so forth, and we're going to get to them. Um, but first, we're going to talk about some other things like plankton. And these guys, some of you may recognize it. This is a pteropod. It's also called a um, sea butterfly. So it's a little marine snail, and it these these little sort of wings here, they're not wings, but it flaps them and it sort of looks like a butterfly as it sort of floats and flaps through the water. They're very small, they're a favorite food of salmon. And this shell that they have is made out of a form of calcium carbonate that's less resistant um, to ocean acidification. And they have shown to already be um, having thinner shells and be suffering from ocean acidification. So they're one of the species that have a definite adverse um, biological impact. But I wanted to spend a little time talking about oysters. Now, some of you may have already heard um, the story of kind of what happened with our local oyster hatcheries. So way back in 2009, they were growing up their baby oysters in their tanks like they always do. They have these big tanks, they pump water into them, they raise the oysters. You can see on this lower picture, this is the size of the baby oysters when they sell them. So they raise them up from um, really, really tiny to only really tiny. Um, and they do this, you know, in the tanks and they pump in seawater for it. But in 2009, they were getting like 90% of their um, oyster larvae were dying and they couldn't figure it out. They're like, they thought maybe it was a virus or they, they didn't know. Um, but it turned out it was the water. The water that they were bringing in was too acidic. And it was taking more energy for these little tiny oysters to build their shells than they had available um, in their like yolk sac. So they just didn't have enough energy to grow big enough to start eating and so they died. So um, the oyster industry was like, well, we gotta, we gotta do something about this. Like if the water that we're using for, you know, raising these oysters that they then sell and they get planted out in all the oyster farms um, are, dying, then, you know, that's, that's not going to work for us. So um, this kind of brings us to this question of like, so what is ocean acidification? And then, you know, why should we care about it? So in order to get a sense of that, um, we're going to do another poll. So I'm going to start polling on this one. And if you all could just take a few seconds and let me know. You can pick as many of these as you want. What it is that you value about the oceans and the Salish Sea. And then also, if you were in charge of an oyster hatchery and you knew that ocean acidification was dangerous for your young oysters, what would be the top steps that you would want to take um, in order to address that? So I'll just give you a little time with those questions to think about it. I'm going to give you a preview of the of some of our results as they're as they're coming in here. Um, we've got a pretty good pretty good spread on uh, what it is that people value 
the uh, the front runner right now is humans need healthy ecosystems to thrive. So, I mean, I, I, I personally agree with all of these. So I'm not, I'm not gonna quibble with any of them. And then the oceans um, and marine life had, have intrinsic value is also a, a, a front runner uh, at the moment. Interestingly, seafood um, is uh, the least, <laughs> the least popular at the moment. So I imagine many of us still eat seafood or people who are eating plant-based diets perhaps, which is a very responsible thing to do. All right, well, we've got, we've got 80% of people voting at this point, which is probably good enough. So let's take a look um, at what we've got here. So like I said, healthy ecosystems, um, that humans rely on healthy ecosystems um, and the intrinsic value of marine life were the, were the highest ones there um, with, with a, a number of people looking at each of the other ones. So but let's look at this next one about the, um, about the oyster hatchery. So, testing the water, uh, treat the water that you bring into your tanks um, and test the water and turn on and off the pumps, turn off the pumps when it's bad. These are both things that oyster hatcheries are doing. Um, this is like, you know, you gotta, you gotta make money this year um, and there's, there's a limited amount that you can do. And so this is what they're doing is, you know, the pH out there varies quite a bit during, during the day or by season um, or according to the weather. So they can turn off the pumps um, when the pH is particularly bad and they can also treat it. They can basically put baking soda in it, which, um, which will help. So those are kind of like really short term, just getting through. Um, not a lot of support for moving somewhere, but that is in fact what Taylor has done. They haven't abandoned their operations here, but they built a whole new hatchery in Hawaii um, that runs off of a saltwater aquifer. It's not even connected to the ocean at all. Um, as sort of medium term insurance that they can still continue to operate um, regardless of what the natural waters around here are doing. Um, Breed more resilient oysters is also something that they are working on that is a sort of medium slash long term plan. Um, you know, people through animal husbandry have been breeding features into animals for a very long time. So it's, it's a time tested uh, strategy. Work for reduced carbon emissions long term was the was the most popular answer here, and that's absolutely the fundamental thing that has to be done. Right, is um, deal with the root of the problem. And the um, people in the shellfish industry have been really great partners in trying to make that happen. So, so I just want to come back to this first part here, though, really quickly, and just note that all of these things um, that we value about the Salish Sea and about the oceans in general are things that are going to be touched on by ocean acidification. That ecosystems, I hope I'll convince you by the end of the talk, although we don't know exactly what's going to happen to them, there's potential for really big changes. Um, and those changes will certainly change the oceans and, and probably in a way that, that no longer supports um, human society the way that it does now. So really this, um, this idea that Humans need healthy ecosystems to thrive. Um, really, I think is the is the core of it, and I'm glad to see that you all are on the same page with me. Okay, so let's get back to um, to our slides here, and I think this is an interesting example. So remember, I mentioned that they are um, breeding resistant oysters. And um, this is an example actually from Australia, a different species of oyster than we have here, but they were working on breeding these Sydney rock oysters um, to be disease resistant. And something about the genetic changes um, that they encouraged through that breeding actually produced oysters that were more um, resistant to ocean acidification. So it is possible um, to do this and it's something that's, that's being worked on. So, that's the story with oysters. Um, let's talk about some of these positive impacts. 
So not all biological impacts are adverse. Eelgrass is a really good example of a species that actually benefits for the most part um, under high CO2. So if you put some eelgrass in a tank and you um, let it grow and it has high CO2, it'll grow faster um, and bigger. You know, the shoots, the rhizomes, all the different parts of it um, really thrive um, in terms of growth when there's high CO2. However, it's complicated. So you're gonna hear me say this a lot. This is, um, this is Tyler Tran, who is a graduate student of mine who graduated recently, and he did a study on eelgrass. Um, and what he found is that although we know CO2 can help eelgrass grow a little bit faster, we had this idea that wouldn't it be great if you had a whole bunch of eelgrass growing or any other kind of marine vegetation um, that you could do this thing called phytoremediation where the plants are taking the CO2 out of the water and making the water therefore friendlier for other animals that might be harmed by ocean acidification. Well, it turns out that although they do take up CO2, um, the growth of the grass can only pull out a lot of CO2 from the water only when there's a lot of grass and not a lot of water. So if you've been out in like Padilla Bay on a relatively low tide, that's the kind of situation that we're talking about where there's just like tons of eelgrass everywhere. Um, there's not a lot of water and it'll just suck the CO2 right out of it and make a really big difference to the water chemistry. But for the most part, there's a lot more water going by any sort of given patch of eelgrass than the eelgrass can really make an impact on. So while the eelgrass itself isn't harmed by ocean acidification in general, it can't really help solve the problem very effectively either. So there are lots of other reasons to love eelgrass. It helps all kinds of resident organisms, um, but CO2 amelioration probably isn't, isn't the top reason to love eelgrass. Okay, so here's some other um, surprising things that, that have come up. So here's an example. This is from the Mediterranean Sea, actually. But there are these little um, snails. They crawl around on the rocks. They eat the algae. This is kind of what it looks like in present day conditions. So nearby, there's like a volcanic vent and it releases CO2 into the water. So there are places that have a kind of a future concentration of CO2 and you can take that as a natural laboratory for what the future might look like. And you might expect there to be fewer of these guys because they have shells that are made of calcium carbonate. Calcifiers generally do poorly, but actually you get 134% increase in the abundance of these um, little snails with their calcium carbonate shells. And the reason is that there's this lush growth of algae that's there. So all of this extra CO2 that's in the water is causing the algae to grow really fast, which is lovely, wonderful food um, for these snails to eat. So sometimes having extra CO2 in the water can be good for things with shells um, if they end up with more food, which can counteract some of the negative things from having more CO2 in terms of building their shells. So, Sometimes we have these maybe unexpected um, results. You can't just say across the board, everything that has a shell is gonna be toast. Here's another example. Um, so they did some studies with clownfish and what happened was that the clownfish seemed to gain agility and speed when there was high CO2 in the water, which is Again, maybe a little surprising, um, but they also started swimming toward the smell of their predators instead of away from them. So you can imagine that's not a really adaptive response to, smell, to swim towards your predators. There's a lot of examples of sort of predator prey interactions that can be affected by ocean acidification. And this is where we get into the things that are a little more nuanced and interesting, you know, like, okay, so it's hard to build, build a shell um, but when you start getting into interactions between one species and another, um, then it's, it's hard to predict what's going to happen. And this one was really interesting and kind of made a big splash. However, again, on the theme of it's complicated, sometimes studies don't agree with each other. So the original study um, showed that, that this was a thing that was happening with clownfish. Um, but then there was another study that came out just this past year that showed that um, that was not the case. Like they did another study closely related um, 
fish and didn't see the same thing. So sometimes studies don't agree with each other. Um, we do know that ocean acidification does have many effects on the smell, the olfactory systems in fish and various different fish, um, but maybe this particular result um, didn't hold, it, hold up the test of time. But I think, again, this is an example of um, science at work, right? This is, this is how science works. We have a finding and we try to replicate it, we try to understand it, and sometimes it holds up and sometimes it doesn't. So I think this one is still up in the air. We need to do more studies um, to figure out why we got one result in one study and a different result in another one. So more reasons that understanding ocean acidification is complicated. So we have our basic picture here of increasing CO2, lowering pH, biological impacts. Well, what if we add nutrients to the picture? So we've got nutrients coming into the water from typically from on land, which can cause blooms of algae. The algae sink and they die. And then you have microbial respiration of that organic matter, which uses up the oxygen in the deep water. And then you have low pH and low oxygen. So you can have multiple things that are changing at once. If we think about the coastal oceans, there's a lot going on here, right? We have upwelling. So we have water that's coming up from the deep ocean and that deep water has had um, oxygen being used up and CO2 being added to it by respiration over time. So it's naturally already kind of acidic and low oxygen. And then it's getting more acidic over time because of ocean acidification. We've got nutrients coming in from our rivers. What's the future of that? Well, that depends strongly on what we do, right? In terms of our sewage treatment plants and our um, management of watersheds and so on. Then we've got the air sea exchange. So we've got CO2 that's in the air. It turns out that studies have shown that local CO2 emissions do actually matter for local um, CO2 concentrations and therefore local water chemistry. So while this is ultimately a global problem, um, local CO2 emissions do actually make a difference. And then all kinds of other things going on, mixing and sediment exchange and all of the photosynthesis and respiration that's going on. It's a very dynamic system. And temperature is of course changing at the same time, oxygen and other things. So we know it's complicated. Uh, let's get back to why we care about, about this. You know, nobody fundamentally, well, I don't know, I might because I'm a marine chemist, care that the pH of the ocean is changing. But for most of us, um, it's the effects on the, on the animals and the, and the plants and the ecosystem um, that really motivate why we care about ocean acidification. So here's a um, result from a paper a few years back where they looked at the effect of ocean acidification. And this is sort of in terms of economic terms here. So you can see we've got um, oysters, clams, and scallops. And these are farmed species groups. So these are all things that are farmed um, in our region. This is for the um, Northeast Pacific, which is here, right? The Northwest of the continent is the Northeast of the ocean. Um, so this red color means it like, likely have a negative effect. So all of these shellfish growing industries are gonna have issues. Um, Atlantic salmon, that bubble is probably gonna get smaller in the future as there are more controls on Atlantic salmon farming, um, but possibly negative, but we don't really know um, what the effects on um, salmon really of any kind will be. So let's take a look um, at the wild species groups. So the ones that are in little boxes are their, their boxes because they're not really harvested, so they don't have a, an economic value. Um, but the first thing you'll notice about this is the top part of this, which are the high, higher trophic levels, right? So trophic level one are the plants and algae, two are the things that eat them, three are the things that eat the things on level two, so on and so forth. So up here at the top, um, where we've got whales and sharks and sea lions and so forth. And all the way down, you know, any of these larger fish, really, we just don't know. They're all in gray because we don't know what the effects are going to be. There's a lot of gray on this, on this um, 
figure and we're, we're hoping to fill in some of those colors as we go forward, but there's a, a lot yet to be done. But I'll point out that phytoplankton are here in blue, which means that it's likely a positive effect. So many phytoplankton will benefit from having more CO2 because they use it as a raw material. Um, so it kind of makes sense. Seagrasses are here in yellow, which is likely neutral. So I talked about how seagrasses, eelgrass, grows faster when there's more CO2. There are some other things that kind of mitigate that. They're, they maybe have more disease um, or less disease resistance um, under high CO2. So as far as we know, those things kind of balance out and they'll be um, neither positively nor negatively affected. Um, but we're not, we don't have really high certainty on any of this. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about herring. I think I could, I think I could put a, some red dots in that one. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about, about crabs as well um, going forward. So, but let's take a moment to consider plankton. So this is a really interesting thing that um, was just, just came out um, in the last couple of months. So these people found these samples from the HMS Challenger. This is an expedition that was in the 1870s and they went around the world and collected all of these samples. It was this sort of dawn of, um, scientific exploration. So um, one of the things they collected were these little um, foraminifera and they've been preserved all this time in a little jar. So some people went and they did some analysis on the shells of these tiny little plankton and they found that the ones that they've collected in modern times are very thin um, compared to the shells from the same species um, that, but that were collected in the 1870s. So it looks like ocean acidification, the changes in the ocean, might be making it harder for plankton, like this one that has a shell made of calcium carbonate to build those shells. So my point being that not all plankton are winners under ocean acidification. Certainly there will be some who, who benefit, but others um, may not. So there'll be some shifts in the composition of the type of plankton that we have. Another interesting one that's come out recently um, is about larval crabs. So this is, in a, this is a, you can see this little picture of a larval crab here. It's about five millimeters across. So we're thinking, you know, like kind of lentil sized little guy, not microscopic, but pretty small. And they collected them off the coast um, of Washington and Vancouver Island here. And they found that when you look at their shells under really, really high magnification, um, they show signs of um, deterioration. So the, shell, the shells of these crab larvae are being damaged by this corrosive water that's present on our coast. Now, to be clear, crab shells are not made of calcium carbonate, but they do have some larval stages um, in which calcium carbonate is important. So, um, you can see these red spots here, and that's, those are the areas where they found the larval crabs that were really damaged. Um, and that's where this corrosive water, when the, when the winds blow the surface water offshore, that water gets replaced with water from below, which has higher CO2 in it and, and lower pH. So those are the areas that are having the most acidic conditions um, and that are seeing these, this shell damage um, or carapace damage in these larval crabs. Another thing that's a little worrisome is they looked really carefully at these larval crabs. And so this picture, this is like a little teeny tiny um, sort of opening, and it's supposed to have a little fiber coming out of it. And that fiber is, is one of the ways that the crabs sense their environment. They have these little sensing fibers, um, and they can tell things about the temperature and the salinity of the water and other things that tell them the conditions so they can know if it's right for them to like go on to their next life stage and settle um, and various other sort of sensory inputs. But those fibers are falling out. Um, the attachment mechanism is no longer very effective when the water is really acidic. So there are these sensory effects that these crabs are probably having as well as sort of physical effects. So um, that's a bit of a worrisome result um, about the larval crabs in this, in this outer coast area um, under these um, acidified conditions. So we don't, we don't know exactly what that means in, in the long run, but it's something that's happening now that's, that's a little worrisome. 
So let's wrap up what we know so far about our biological impacts. So we know that in general, things with calcium carbonate shells, like our sea butterflies and our oysters, um, are gonna have trouble. We've got eelgrass that's sort of in this medium, has some pros, has some cons. We have to put a rainbow box here around our plankton. Some plankton do well, other, others do poorly um, under acidified conditions. Um, well, let's take a minute to talk about herring. So herring are a really important um, member of, the, of our group of forage fish here. So obviously we've got phytoplankton at the base of our food web that are eaten by zooplankton, and then forage fish are this link um, between the plankton and between all of these sort of larger animals and higher trophic levels. I had to add the orca over here myself because why isn't there an orca on here? Who eats the salmon? It's the orcas. Okay, anyway, so forage fish are important. Um, my student, Christina um, Villalobos, did a study on these um, with herring from Cherry Point. And so she looked at the embryos. So herring spawn in near shore coastal waters. They like to spawn on like eelgrass and other kinds of vegetation. And we know from previous studies that CO2 by itself doesn't have a lot of effect um, on herring, or at least on Atlantic herring, and we found out also on Pacific herring. Temperature we know does have um, a negative effect. If it's too warm, they don't do very well. But what we wanted to know was what happens if CO2 and temperature change at the same time? Like you might just say, all right, well, we'll do an experiment where we increase the CO2, and if nothing happens, then we can cross them off the list. So they're like, okay, they're going to be fine. Um, but that's, of course, not what's really happening out there in the real world. Temperature is also changing at the same time as CO2. So, um, so we wanted to do a study to look at what happens when you change two things at once. So she looked at their heart rates and their mortality. This is what a dead herring embryo looks like, um, how big they were, whether they had deformities when they have these sort of curved spines, they can't really swim. Um, so things like that were what she looked at. And here's what she found. So as expected, when temperature was warmer, their heart rates went up, which sort of, they're sort of working harder. Um, their mortality went up, so they didn't survive as well. There were more deformities um, and they were smaller. So none of these things are, are good. Um, so when the temperature went from 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit, from 10 to 16 Celsius, um, fundamentally what you have is an increase in energy demand um, and they can't really meet it fully and so some of them die. So what happens when we add CO2 to this picture? Well, so we've got mortality on the y-axis and our four treatments on the x-axis, which we'll talk about here. So this one is current CO2 and current temperature. So, you know, a little bit less than 20% sort of a normal rate of these embryos not hatching. If you increase the temperature, that mortality rate goes up to 40% about twice as many of them die when you increase up the temperature. Um, if you, this one right here, if you do the other A here, if you increase the CO2, but not the temperature, nothing really happens. Um, but if you increase the CO2 and the temperature, so you've got future CO2 and future temperature, the mortality rate goes up to like 60%. So, you might think that CO2 doesn't have an effect, but when you combine it with temperature, it in fact does. When you have those two challenges at the same time, um, they interact with each other and you get an even higher mortality rate. Now, I mean, this is only one study, um, so we're not gonna say that, you know, herring are doomed or anything like that, but it is um, worrisome that, you know, we could have some, some negative effects um, for herring in the future and therefore for, for the food web in general. So, but again, I'm gonna come back to my theme of it's complicated. In this case, there was another study that was done with Atlantic herring um, and they showed that although the effect of CO2 was negative for the Atlantic herring larvae, um, it was positive for the things that they eat. So this plankton community, when they had more CO2, they did better. And ultimately, the herring did better because they had more and better food. And that offset the negative effects of having high CO2 um, when they were growing. So it's complicated.
And that may or may not be true for Pacific herring. We haven't done a study yet. So let's get back to our, our summary. So I'm going to put rainbow boxes around all of these. So we, we can expect there's different effects for different kinds of plankton. Um, and for species like herring and crabs, we just don't know enough yet. We know that there are some, there are some negative effects, um, but we don't know if those will be outweighed by other um, potentially positive effects that haven't been, um, haven't been studied yet. So we put it all together, plus the fact that there is adaptation as a possibility that these changes, while they're happening very quickly, um, on the scale at which evolution normally happens. Adaptation is a possibility um, for, some, for some populations. So, you know, I'm gonna shake up my magic eight ball here and try to make a prediction and it's very hard, right? Reply hazy, try again later. So we just don't know what's gonna happen. Um, there are some very smart people um, at the IPCC and they came out with a report um, just in September about the ocean and the cryosphere and a changing climate. And I want to just put up a couple of things from that um, to give you a, a global context about kind of what we do and don't know. So the global oceans are virtually certain to get more acidic going forward. If you look at this graph on the left, we've got change in pH over time. And by 2100, we've got two different lines here. The red line is probably unrealistically pessimistic and the blue line is unrealistically um, optimistic. So the reality of where we'll be is somewhere in the middle, depending on how hard we work and all cooperate to make some changes in terms of carbon emissions. Um, but no matter what, um, pH is going down um, in the ocean everywhere. Um, and you can see it's more extreme towards the, um, towards the poles. Um, Nutrients, the IPCC is predicting that the available nutrients are also going to go down. So the graph on the left is change in nitrate, which is frequently the thing that limits growth of phytoplankton in the ocean. And again, red is pessimistic, blue is optimistic. Um, but, you know, so we're probably going to end up with maybe 10% less nitrate available, um, give or take, and depending on where you are. Um, because of how the ocean circulation works. But the available of nutrients is likely to decrease in the future, which means the productivity of marine algae is gonna go down. If they don't have that ingredient of nitrogen that they need, um, then they won't be able to keep growing. So the productivity of algae in the ocean will go down you know, 5%, you know, give or take. And again, depending on where you are. Um, and the result of that is that the catch potential for commercial fisheries that people depend on will go down. So in the Pacific Northwest, we're kind of in this blue color, which is somewhere between five and 15%. So our potential to catch fish is projected to go down, you know, maybe 10%. It could go down as much as 50% in some places. And in the places where these reductions are greatest, are also the places where people are relying most on fish as a proportion of their animal source food in the present day. So this really brings in a climate justice aspect to this as well, that it's not the impacts necessarily on us, but also thinking about impacts on really vulnerable communities um, that, that we should be considering. Okay, so points to remember. Oceans are becoming more acidic because of inputs of carbon. In the Salish Sea, it's driven also by runoff and nutrient inputs. Effects are widespread, but not easily predicted <laughs> for a given organism or for a suite of organisms for that matter. When combined with temperature changes in temperature and oxygen, effects are clearly negative for human society and that local action can influence our local waters. So here are five actions that the state of Oregon has identified and Washington is doing similar stuff or Oregon just had a nice graphic of it. So advancing scientific understanding, developing strategies to reduce the causes. Um, and they, they use the term OAH here, which is ocean acidification and hypoxia or hypoxia is low oxygen. Um, support the resilience to OAH in Oregon's ecosystems and communities share science to raise awareness, um, 
and then build sustained support to mobilize agencies to address these issues. Okay, so that's kind of on a, on a grand scale, um, but what can we as individuals do about it is the next question. Well, one of the things that many of you are doing, you know, and in being involved in local efforts and citizen science, um, there's a nice example of a Baywatchers group um, from the East Coast that was able to really show how nutrient inputs um, were playing into ocean acidification and therefore into, shell, into the shellfish industry. Um, so those kinds of efforts can really be helpful. Um, you know, educate yourself and others. Be engaged in political action to support responsible climate policies. We really need leadership and guts on this from Democrats and Republicans. Um, support local water quality efforts. I know I'm preaching to the choir here. You guys are already doing this, but um, reduce your nitrogen footprint. So think about your um, nutrient management that you might be able to influence in terms of if you have a septic tank, you know, keeping it well maintained, rain gardens, low impact development, using fertilizer property properly, and then of course reducing your own carbon footprint. So I want to do one more poll here. And this one is about um, what we're already doing. So what are you doing um, to address our car carbon emissions? And again, you can choose as many as you like on this poll. We'll just give you all a few moments to take a look at what our options are. Efficient lighting, washing cold water, driving less. Oh, except for I have a typo in there. Sorry about that. Seal and insulate your home, switch to a hybrid or electric car, eating a plant-based diet, buying green power, flying less, living car free, and having fewer children. I will say that the first time I talked to somebody, and this was, I mean, maybe 20 years ago at this point, and they said that they were having fewer children because of the carbon impact. I honestly thought they were a little bit bonkers. Um, but the more time I spend with this, and you know, the sort of deeper I, I am into understanding it, um, the more I think that making that this is a big problem. And so making big choices um, with this as part of it actually really makes sense. Okay, we've got, I think we've got a pretty good, oh, we got a couple more that just came in. Okay, I'm about to press the button to end it if anyone wants to get a last one in there. Okay, we got a, we got a pretty good sampling here, so let's take a look. I'll share these results with you. So the highest ones um, are driving less and having efficient lighting. Everybody, or not everybody, but a lot of people are doing those, over 68% or so. Um, having fewer children is actually right up there, um, and uh, which I think is, is, is interesting that you all are um, making important decisions um, based on this, which I think is great. So let's um, let's take a look. So the we've got a pretty good spread across here. Um, we've got representation for all of these. Um, let's take a look at a um, paper that gives some some context on this. So this is a paper that came out that was climate mitigation. Um, missing the most effective individual actions. So this one was specifically about individual actions that people can take. And on the y-axis, we have emissions savings. So how much you could save by taking this action and going from low impact um, on the right to high impact over here. So although all of us have upgraded our light bulbs, it's really not making a big difference. It's still good to do. Um, every little bit helps, but you know, nobody's saving the earth single-handedly by with their LED bulbs. Um, a lot of these other ones, you know, in terms of washing clothes in cold water and so forth, 
um, again, fairly low impact. The much higher impact ones um, are, and these are all things that at least some of us are doing, um, eating a plant-based diet really makes a difference. I'll also point out that there's different levels by country here. So switching an electric car to car free makes a bigger difference if you live in the USA or Australia than it does if you live in Belgium. That's just because people in the USA and Australia drive a lot more than the people in Belgium do. Um, so buy a more efficient car, buy green energy. Um, avoiding a transatlantic flight. This is, this is one that's difficult for, for people, I think, you know, that we, we want to go places and, and see things and visit our family and these, these sorts of things. Um, but, you know, one transatlantic or maybe for us more likely, you know, from the East Coast to the West Coast of the United States, one round trip like that, you know, it can wipe out all of the good that you've done um, by switching from an electric car to car free. So that's a, it's a big impact on your life, you know, going car free that you can completely wipe out by just going on one flight. So flights are, are big. Um, living car free, of course, um, that transportation has a really big impact on our, on our carbon footprints. And then just how many of us there are, right? I mean, the average American is emitting 120 um, of these gigatons per year. So if there are a few of us, fewer of us will have smaller um, emissions. I added seal and insulate your house on here myself. I guess they didn't consider it an individual action, but I, I do, and, and, it's, and it can be sizable. Um, so it's another thing to consider. So um, I wanted to bring a little bit of a personal note into this. No. Oh. Um, like I said, you know, when I first started out with this and I was a newbie, um, I was a little shocked at the idea of making really, really big life decisions with carbon footprint as a big part of that. Um, but, you know, this is my son, he's nine. And, um, you know, I want there to be a healthy uh, world for him when he grows up. So I'm really motivated um, to make good decisions uh, for the future. And, and I, um, I know that you all are too. So this is one of my favorite cartoons. Um, just for wrapping it up. It says, day 44, still stranded with nothing but flat, empty water as far as the eye can see. I think this is a really good way of sort of imagining how it is that we are interacting with the oceans, right? We're, we're sitting up here and we can't see anything that's going on while there's this sort of vibrant and amazing um, life and, and sort of drama that's happening beneath the waves. So. There's a lot that you cannot tell from looking at the surface of things. And we still really have a lot to learn about the oceans and about ocean acidification in particular. But as you can see, there's a potential, a lot of potential for change. Um, and we just don't know how all of those changes are gonna fit together. But being cautious about changing a world that could really pull the rug out from under our feet, um, if we do change it, is really a good place to start. So. Um, that is my formal presentation, and um, I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. So you can put them in the chat um, if you want to. You can fill out the presentation survey that Destiny has just posted. Also, you can feel free to just un unmute your mic at this point and ask a question if you want to. Hi, Brooke, it's Destiny again. Um, I think it might be helpful if folks know how to do this to go into the chat just so that if we don't um, have a bunch of people talking at once and raise your hand, if you recall how to do that, just go to participants and find your name. And if you click on it, um, this should be at the bottom, raise hand. So if you have any questions, if you wanna raise your hand, uh, that would be great. Oh. 
Oh, looks like there's a problem with the post presentation survey. Somebody said, thanks for the presentation. You're welcome. I'm very happy to do it. <laughs> oh, Eleanor says she's working on fixing the link for the survey. So thank you all who are still here for hanging around. And hopefully, we can get you a link for the post survey that will work. Someone said, thanks for giving me something to do this evening. Very welcome. Um, I'm, I am happy to have been able to give a presentation with, you know, my cat in my lap here. So, uh, and yes, oh, I have been recording it. Um, and so I will provide the, the link for that to, uh, to Eleanor and she should be able to um, distribute it to anybody who, um, who wants a, a copy to give to other people. And Dr. Love, it looks like we have a question from Chris Hawley. Chris, if you want to turn your mute off, you can go ahead and ask your question. Hi. Uh, yeah. So I had just had a question about the, uh, can you, I just want to make, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. I can hear great. you. Great. Great. Okay. Um, I had a question about the, um, I've heard conflicting information about the Great Barrier Reef as far as ocean acidification and, and heat is concerned. Uh, one article I read said it's going to be gone in five years. One said it was starting to look a little bit better. One said it's gone in 30 years. So do we know where the literature rests right now on that specific ecosystem? So, yeah. Um... Well, there's a couple of different questions about the Great Barrier Reef. There's the um, sort of growth, there's the calcification part, um, and that is definitely on a downward trend, like the corals are not able to grow as well um, as they were before. And I think the most recent thing that I've seen on that, that I found um, creditable was you know, it's a it's a re relatively slow trajectory. Well, more like that 25 year um, kind of, which I guess maybe isn't slow if you think about it, um, but it's not like it's gonna be dead next year. So from the acidification standpoint, I think that sort of 25 to 50 year um, kind of window is, is what we're looking at before it gets really, really bad um, from acidification. But warming is a different question. Um, and there have been some really bad bleaching events the last several years um, that have been um, connected with high temperatures. And so it seems like there, like there might be a tipping point um, that's being approached in terms of the temperature getting too high and the corals, you know, ejecting um, their symbionts. So it's kind of both from from what I know, right? That the, the CO2 is a bit of a longer time time scale, but the temperature really might be looking at a at, as a, a more of a dangerous tipping point in the in the much nearer future. So um, yeah, if you want to see the Great Barrier Reef, you should go now, but you shouldn't go. Definitely don't go. <laughs> don't go anywhere, but definitely don't fly to Australia, even outside of present circumstances. So <laughs> I, hope, I don't know if that answers your question, but. Yeah, that's the challenging part, right? I think we all want to see it, but uh, you know, I know it's the right call to not go and see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. So um, somebody asked if we're getting enough funding um, to continue the science research. Um, I mean, you know, funding in, in science is always um, difficult and competitive. But, um, but I think there, there's been a, a pretty good um, 
you know, relative to other things, there's pretty good interest among funders, the National Science Foundation and others in, um, in funding ocean acidification research. I think there's a recognition that it's, that's an important thing that we don't know enough about. So it's not, it's not easy, but I would say that it's um, no harder than many of the other important questions. Um, someone was asking if there's going to be more presentations, and I think that um, I think that at the beginning they were saying that there are going to be some more. Um, maybe Destiny, do you want to chime in on that? Yes. Yeah, so our next webinar is scheduled for April 20th at 3 p.m., and we'll be sending out, I'm sure, um, an email for that. But that's going to be by Lisa Hillier from the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife on monitoring foraged fish of the Salish Sea. So we are planning on having more of these and we do hope that you tune in. Yeah. Um, someone was asking, let's see, thoughts on carbon offsetting when you have to fly. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's some, there are some good car carbon offsetting um, sort of outfits. And and absolutely, if you if you do need to fly, then then offsetting that that carbon is a good. Um, I would say it's a it's a good option. Um, you know, because sometimes you do have to go. How have the tribes reacted to this information? Um, yeah, I would say that the tribes are um, definitely partners in in trying to make a difference here. Some of the tribes do operate their own hatcheries, and so they have really a direct interest um, in these these thoughts. And then, just of course, the kind of cultural and and economic and subsistence harvest of of shellfish, um, and then if, you know get into crabs and so forth. So um, they're certainly um, interested. I don't know that there's a whole lot of sort of direct research that's going on um, with tribal scientists, although. There has been some. I've been work, worked with some people at Swinomish um, and some of the others that are doing some at least monitoring. Um, and so there's definitely interest um, in doing research um, and monitoring and collaboration um, from the tribes for sure. Someone wanted to know more about nitrogen footprint. Um, yeah, so everybody, you know, the activities that we do in our everyday lives um, can contribute to runoff that has that has nutrients in it. So it's one of the reasons why, you know, rain gardens are a really good idea. So anything that takes water and filters it through the soil um, is going to help bind up some of those nutrients before they can before they can get out to the ocean um, and can be really helpful. The other some of the other things that I mentioned, um, you know, sewage is a really big one. Most of us, um, if you're in Bellingham, you know you don't have a whole lot of say about what happens to your to your sewage. Um, I will say that our sewage treatment plant is, you know, does a really good job, um, but they don't yet have the sort of phase of treatment that would be removing nitrogen. So some of it gets removed as solids, um, but there isn't. We don't have the sort of step that would actually take the dissolved nitrogen out of the water, which is possible but expensive. Um, but it's something that could potentially be done in the future um, if the city and the state and the regulators decide to make it a um, to make it a priority. So it's possible on a municipal level to to reduce um, nitrogen impacts as well. But on an individual basis, it's sort of if you've got septic, you can make sure it's not leaking, um, and then really thinking about not over applying fertilizer um, and thinking about the runoff from your property are kind of the biggest ones. Um, and yeah, I will make sure that this recording um, is available through um, through your group, and uh, so that people can can share it. And you know, I would I'd have to go back and look. Um, I I don't know off the top of my head what a what a really reputable carbon offset outfit is, but maybe someone else in the group does and can suggest one. Well, I think maybe that's it. Um, 
for questions. So, oh, and here's Eleanor is saying where, where the recording will be posted. So that's great. Um, but if that's it, I think I will say thank you and good night to all of you. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Brooklove. That was really awesome. Again, um, just make sure that you fill out the survey if you can if you can get to the survey this time. Just make sure you fill out the survey and do make sure that you fill out your hours um, on Track It Forward. So thank you all. Have a good night. <laughs>